In deciding what to cover for Lagim's second season finale, and also last episode of the year, I had a number of cases in my head. I had started so many scripts that I have left unfinished because I did not feel it was their time to be published yet. Last season, I covered the Peter Scully case because the case would not let me be. The horrible nature of his crimes needed to be made known to serve as a warning and a call to action to better protect our children. But for this season, I thought I'd start with a case that rattled us awake on the very first day of 2021. Whilst some of us were recovering from a bad hangover or struggling to decide on what to eat for their first meal of the new year, somewhere in Makati, the financial district of the Philippines, tragedy had struck. This case would become yet another example of the glaring problems within our police forces, especially when they are put under intense public scrutiny and pressure. This is the case of Christine Dacera. Mabuhay and welcome to Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. My name is Christine and I am your host. If you're new to the podcast, welcome and thank you for stopping by. Make sure to follow us on social media on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All links to these platforms are in the show notes. If you're not new here, thanks for coming back for another episode. To all my Lagim fam, if you like this podcast, please take a few seconds to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and also to rate us on Spotify. I would be much obliged. As always, please note that this case contains details that may be upsetting and unsettling for some people. So always take care of yourself whilst listening. Christine Angelica Faba da Serra was born on the 13th of April 1997 in General Santos City in Mindanao. She was the second of four siblings. As a young girl, it became clear to the people around her that she was smart, creative, and had a knack for the performing arts. She attended the Heritage Academy of the Philippines in General Santos City from 2008 until 2013 before enrolling at the University of the Philippines Mindanao campus to study communication and media. She also became part of the university cheerleading squad and blossomed into a beautiful and intelligent young woman. Impressively, she graduated cum laude from UP and went on to work as a marketing associate for a prominent mall chain in Mindanao between 2017 and 2019. It came to no one's surprise that during and after her stint as a marketing associate, she entered the world of pageants. Christine, after all, had it all. The confidence, the smarts, the warm personality, and of course, the beauty. In 2017, she was the first runner-up in the Miss Silva Davao pageant. Two years later, she competed in the Mutianan Davao and made it to the finals. Despite not winning a title, Christine did not seem like the one who would get discouraged to continue her pursuit of great things. After her rather short pageant run, she started working as a flight attendant for Philippine Airlines, the flag carrier of the Philippines. This was also in 2019. By then, she had moved to Davao City only to move away again to Pasay in Metro Manila. For over a year, she traveled, enjoyed her new job, and even amassed quite a following on social media where she allowed her followers sneak peeks into the ongoings of her job, her social life, and the people she socialized with. If her Instagram or TikTok feeds were any indication of the kind of life she led, then one could see a vibrant young woman who loved fashion, friends, seeing new places, and making new memories. But all that prospect and potential came to a grinding halt on the 1st of January 2021. 
Please bear in mind that the version of events currently accepted by the police is still disputed by many, especially Christine's family. So, anyway, what happened? On the 28th of December 2020, Christine finished working her last shift of the year aboard a Philippine Airlines flight. A picture of herself in personal protective equipment was taken by a friend. This picture would become Christine's last Instagram post with the caption, last flight for this one hell of a year. The next thing we learn about Christine's movements is that she checked into the City Garden Hotel in Makati City with three friends identified as Romel Galida, Gregorio de Guzman, and John de la Serna. They all stayed together in room 2209. Note that de Guzman would later explain that he had met Christine for the first time that day they checked into the hotel. They planned a New Year's Eve celebration, and that took place also in room 2209. The celebration was going well with people ordering food, eating, and drinking. According to witnesses, more men joined the party later that evening. They were identified as friends of friends who occupied an adjacent room, room 2207 to be specific. All in all, there were nine of them, bringing the total number of party-ready hotel guests to 13, including Christine. De Guzman would later say in an interview that the men who joined them did not look familiar to him. However, what stood out was that they looked a bit older than the others at the party. And so the party continued between the two rooms, with people going back and forth. By 1224, after Christine and her friends welcomed 2021, Christine called her family back in Jensen. After their conversation, Christine made her way back to the others to continue partying. CCTV footage obtained by major Filipino news outlets provided glimpses into what happened in the hours afterwards when things went from jolly to concerning. At 2.50 in the morning, Christine can be seen going with one of her friends from room 2209 to room 2207. By 3.34, she can be seen with three other men seemingly trying to calm her down as she looked and seemed upset, as if ready to fight someone. Another part of the footage showed her and another male friend coming from room 2207 smiling by 5.05 a.m. It is presumed that there was a constant hither and thither between the two rooms. At 6.23, a male friend with a baseball cap on can then be seen carrying Christine from 2207 back to 2209. As I understand it, Christine had already started feeling ill and had also started vomiting around 5 or 6 that morning which was probably why she was carried back into 2209 by a friend. One of her friends also explained that they helped her get into bed after this to make sure she got some rest. After this, it seemed like the movements between the two rooms became less and less, and we would learn that one by one, the rest of the partygoers had decided to finally call it a night and sleep. But... That was not all what happened inside 2209. One of the men who was at the party named Clark Rapinan said that Christine kept vomiting again around 7.30 in the morning. He apparently helped her out whilst she was sick in the bathroom and then gave her a bathrobe. By 8 that morning, Rapinan urged Christine to go and sleep on a bed in their room. Christine apparently refused this, not wanting to vomit and ruin the bed. It is my understanding that Christine agreed to stay in the bathtub instead. By 10 that same morning, another friend of Christine's, Romel Galida, woke up and saw Christine in the bathtub. Thinking that she was still asleep, he placed a blanket over her to keep her warm. He then went back to sleep. Galida later insisted that Christine was still breathing at this point. 
Around two hours later, Galida woke up again and wanted to wake up the rest of the group to finally go home. He went to the bathroom and noticed how Christine looked different and how she had seemingly stopped breathing. Panic set in. He tried to rouse her. He looked for a pulse, but there was nothing. Galida then woke up the rest of the group to get them to help him with Christine. Galida stated in an interview later with Jessica Soho that de Guzman and Rapinan administered CPR whilst Galida shouted for help in the corridor, potentially to get the attention of the other people who were at the party the previous night. Hotel reception was also alerted. Christine's friends would later claim that they asked the hotel to send in any medical equipment or personnel to help Christine. In the CCTV footage obtained by the media, we can see how hotel employees responded to room 2209 and brought with them a wheelchair. The other members of the group then called for an ambulance. Three minutes later, the CCTV footage showed how Christine was essentially wheeled out of room 2209. Christine's friends later commented that despite their obvious panic and obvious desperation about what happened to their friend, the hotel staffers were quite slow in their response to this emergency. No medical personnel or medical kit were brought to their room, just the wheelchair that was seen on the CCTV footage. The friends would also later say that even the wheelchair was way too small for Christine. Christine was then rushed to the Makati Medical Center after attempts to revive her in the hotel clinic failed. It is my understanding that the hotel called for a rescue team from the Poblacion Barangay Hall, but no one responded and no one came to help Christine. And so Christine's friends were the ones who rushed her to the hospital as quickly as they could. At the hospital, Christine Dacera was pronounced dead upon arrival. The first person notified of Christine's death was Dr. Marici Ramos, someone Christine considered as her second mother in Manila. When she arrived at the hospital, she was allowed to see Christine's body, and she immediately grew concerned about the many bruises on Christine's body, especially her legs. Her initial assessment of what she saw was that Christine looked like she sustained the injuries as a result of a struggle and how the injuries looked like they were deliberately inflicted. Dr. Ramos then thought it best to immediately go to the police station in Makati to report what had happened to Christine. At this point, the other men who were in attendance at the New Year's Eve party had already left the hotel, whilst three were detained by the Makati police. One of the three apparently managed to slip away without being noticed by the police officers, which is utterly baffling, but a sign of things to come in this case. Later on, another man, Gregorio de Guzman, who we have heard about before already, surrendered voluntarily to the Makati police. The other men arrested were John de la Serna and Paul Halili, who also happened to be the hotel manager. By the 2nd of January, an initial autopsy was said to have been conducted on Christine's body by medical legal officer Police Major Michael Sarmiento. In the report that would later explain his findings, Major Sarmiento did not think that Christine died as a result of foul play. In the report that would later explain his findings, Major Michael Sarmiento did not think that Christine died as a result of foul play. He instead concluded that she died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. When these findings were made public on the 3rd of January, Christine's family refused to believe them. Dr. Ramos, for example, told the police what she had seen at the hospital when she was allowed to view Christine's body. The bruises and a laceration in her inner thigh surely pointed to more than a ruptured aneurysm. Now, this was a normal and understandable reaction from Christine's loved ones, but the Philippine National Police, or PNP, were not helpful after they revealed these findings. 
I found it especially very bizarre that in the same breath the police also explained that despite initial opinions leaning towards death due to natural causes, aka the aneurysm, they also noted that rape or gang rape also possibly took place. So which one is it? Nothing was clear at this point. A day later on the 4th of January, Filipinos woke up to the news from the PNP who in less than 24 hours decided that Christine had died because of foul play, declaring her case a rape slay case officially. Immediately afterwards, rape and homicide complaints were filed against 11 men identified to have been with Christine at the hotel, which of course included her close friends. When asked why they so suddenly changed their stance, the police explained that injuries on Christine's arms and legs, plus traces of sperm in her, gave them cause to believe that this was a rape slay case. The only problem with this statement is that the PNP never provided anybody with an autopsy or medico legal report that showed these new findings with regards to, for example, the traces of sperm. At this point, people on the internet had started to weigh in on the matter. They shared their thoughts and opinions and, of course, also their vitriol. One could feel the mounting pressure on the police to come up with answers. And it is probably and partially due to this pressure that the police decided to file those complaints I just mentioned. However, a closer look at these complaints will show us that the complaints were only provisional in nature, meaning that the 11 men were merely provisionally charged with homicide and rape. I found this an odd legal instrument, as from the outside, it gave one the impression that the police had already uncovered and found enough evidence to have probable cause to say that a homicide and rape had taken place. But as we know, the autopsy from the 3rd of January did not mention anything about rape. So probable cause was not present, or at least the cause was not as probable as it should have been. The police in reality filed an incomplete complaint in which a prosecutor decides to sit on his hands first whilst waiting for additional evidence to come up in order to either complete the complaint or drop the case altogether. In this particular case, the prosecutor was waiting for more evidence to substantiate the rape and murder allegations. In a way, it would have been the same as not charging them at all or not filing a complaint altogether because there was nothing that anybody could do at this point without this additional evidence. Meanwhile, let us not forget that despite these provisional charges, the majority of the men at the hotel party were and are still roaming around free. The court had not and refused to grant an arrest warrant just yet. And still, Despite all these flip-flopping and inconsistencies from the Philippine National Police, Police General De Bold Sinas had already boldly declared the case solved. It seems to me that with the detention of three of the 11 suspects, the PNP felt confident that they could build a strong case already. But there was one problem that the PNP did not see coming. The three detained men vehemently denied hurting and or raping Christine because how could they? They are all gay. In fact, according to the three men, all of the men who attended the New Year's Eve party at the hotel were and are in fact gay. As a response, the PNP insisted that despite being gay, they are still men. The PNP seems or seemed to imply back then that despite being attracted to only men, gay men still cannot help themselves but have sex or rape women because of their male instincts. I cannot tell you how utterly ludicrous and validating and ignorant such a claim is. 
This shows just how non-existent the understanding of the LGBTQ community within the Philippine National Police is. However, the police may actually have had reason to truly believe their statement or their claim about the gay men because they saw something in the hotel CCTV footage that made them doubt the so-called gay narrative. At 2.52 a.m. on the 1st of January, one could see one of the men named Valentin Rosales with Christine outside room 2209. Christine, who seemed a bit drunk already, briefly kissed or tried to kiss Rosales. In the footage, and due to the high angle of the camera, it looked like Rosales was reciprocating that kiss, but he would later tell Jessica Soho in an interview that he was trying to move his face away from her. He also explained that Christine would sometimes do this kind of thing whenever she drank alcohol because she liked Chinito men and Rosales is Chinito, or someone with typical East Asian looking eyes. Rosales stated firmly that he didn't kiss Christine and that he was definitely gay and still is and did not feel in any way attracted to his friend. By the 5th of January, Christine's family expressed their frustration with the investigation. They particularly disputed the autopsy report and it was then that we learned that prior to the first autopsy, Christine's body was already embalmed leading many people to rightfully think that the autopsy could not have been a reliable process in this specific case. It is my understanding that once a body has been embalmed, checking for trace evidence and ordering toxicology tests are impossible and perhaps useless because one will not get proper and reliable results anymore. With toxicology tests, for example, how could someone conduct such tests when embalming fluid had now been pumped into the deceased person's body? As it turned out, the family was not even informed about the embalming that took place before the first autopsy. Their consent was never obtained. Two issues that greatly raised concerns. Christine's family demanded now to have her body autopsied for a second time. On the 6th of January, Justice Secretary Manardo Guevara told the media that the forensic medicine team within the NBI, or the National Bureau of Investigation, was now involved in determining Christine's cause of death. It was not clear at this point whether an autopsy or examination of any kind took place, and I say this because later that day, Christine's body was transferred to Kamkrame, the PNP headquarters, for a private funeral service with her family and a few close friends. Whilst this was ongoing in Kamkrame, the three men who were detained a few days before were actually released upon the order of the Makati City Prosecutor's Office. According to them, the police needed to submit the results of DNA testing along with any toxicology report and results of any histopath examination. Christine Dacera's remains were then flown back to Jensan the next day on the 7th of January, where she was laid to rest three days later. It was only after she was flown home that the public was told that a second autopsy had indeed taken place before Christine's body was flown back to her hometown. However, the public was also informed that the results would remain confidential for now. By the 8th of January, the PNP made a statement about how there was perhaps a big possibility that the samples taken from Christine's body for the purpose of the autopsy were contaminated because she had already gone through the embalming process. This might not be the admission that it should have really been, but essentially, even the PNP probably realized at this point that the investigation had been botched badly. In the following days, the PNP scrambled to make things right, it seemed to me, or better said, the Department of Justice stepped in to make things right for the PNP. 
They kept the public informed about how the results of the forensic examination of the samples taken from Christine's body would be published soon, how they had already identified most of the men who partied with Christine, how the NBI were making progress in determining whether there were lapses in the first autopsy. The NBI itself informed the public that they have sent the fluids collected from the second autopsy to the so-called Death Investigation Division for further testing. On the 11th of January, during an interview with Jessica Soho, we would also learn from some of the men at the party that Christine had told them how she felt weird at some point, that she suspected one of her drinks was laced with something. This detail highlighted yet again how important it was to have obtained uncontaminated blood and or fluid samples from Christine to see if her drinks were spiked or if she had been poisoned. Whether the substances used to spike her drink could still be detected after a few hours or whether her drinks were spiked at all could all have been determined had the autopsy been done right. I realized that the NBI at this point in the case's timeline were still supposed to double check if the forensic samples from Christine's body were contaminated or not. But I guess even a non-expert can clearly see that if the blood inside Christine's body had been replaced by embalming fluid already, how on earth could anything be tested at all? Now, the NBI did reveal at some point that around 100 ml of urine was extracted from Christine's bladder. But then again, one would have to be very skeptical of any results from any urine tests done to see what had caused Christine's death. It is my understanding that the urine was tested for drugs, amongst many things, which in the end turned out negative. In the meantime, there was more bad news for the PNP. The legal representative for five of the 11 men involved in the case revealed that the Makati police had pressured her clients to admit that drugs were used during the party something that the men vehemently denied from the very beginning. To further drive home this point, the men made public their drug test results from tests done between January 4th and 11th. These were posted on a public Facebook page that is unfortunately not available anymore as far as my research is concerned. At this point, the murder and rape angles of the case appeared to have weakened substantially. Soon enough, the PNP started throwing at least four colleagues of theirs under the bus by recommending the relief of two investigators, the medical legal officer, Major Sarmiento, and another officer involved in the investigation. This happened on the 20th of January. It felt to me like the PNP was sort of cleaning house in preparation for what came next. On the 27th of January, homicide had been ruled out completely as a cause of death in Christine's case. The PNP stuck to their findings that Christine died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm and potentially also of undiagnosed hypertension. According to the PNP, this was substantiated by the autopsy results in relation to the weight and size of Christine's heart at the time of her death. Instead of weighing the normal 300 grams, the autopsy report showed that her heart weighed 500 grams instead. In the same vein, the police admitted that no drugs were involved during the party. There were previous allegations of the presence of a white powdery substance in the hotel rooms, but the suspects had insisted that the substance was in fact just salt. The PNP finally confirmed this as well. By mid-February, the preliminary investigation into the case had ended. By mid-February, the preliminary investigation into the case had officially ended. And you would think that that would be the end of it, but you would be wrong. A mere three weeks or so after the end of the investigation in February, 
the PNP asked the prosecutors in charge to reopen Christine's case after receiving the results of the toxicology and semen analysis exam results. Furthermore, on the 12th of March, the NBI made a recommendation to file an obstruction of justice charge against the 11 men who were first tagged in Christine's death. The NBI stated that there was and is still a potential case of reckless imprudence resulting in homicide, saying that the men were aware that Christine was not feeling alright at some point during the party. She was complaining of a headache and she kept on vomiting. The NBI felt like the men failed to observe these details and symptoms and address what was going on accordingly. On the same day, charges were also filed against the medical legal officer, Major Sarmiento, who embalmed Christine without the consent of her family. Now, things were already complicated to begin with, but by March this year, the battle was not merely against the police authorities and the Justice Department, who obviously did not do their jobs right. Now, the families of some of the men involved and the Daceras have become involved in a bitter legal battle. Five of the 11 men tagged in Christine's death had filed countercharges against the Dacera family for malicious prosecution, incriminating innocent persons, perjury, and libel. It is still not clear what the result of this case is. After the PNP asked the Makati City Prosecutor's Office to reopen the case against the 11 men, we would later learn on the 23rd of April that the prosecutors had in fact dismissed the rape and homicide cases due to lack of evidence. This would mean that whatever the toxicology report and the semen analysis report yielded did not prove that the 11 men were involved in any sort of foul play that caused Christine's death. It is possible and certainly plausible that whatever those test results yielded and whatever the second autopsy showed the forensic examiners somehow vindicated the men in whatever they had said so far in this case. For example, with regards to Christine's bruises, the men had always maintained that she sustained those by kneeling down that evening in order to vomit. One of the 11 men, who also happened to be Christine's close friend, had always maintained that some of the bruises and even that one laceration in her inner thigh were injuries that Christine sustained way before the New Year's Eve's party and could not have been a result of any assault on Christine's person. In a 19-page resolution, the prosecutors stated, amongst other things, that, and I quote, Evidence presented are insufficient to engender a well-founded belief that rape, homicide, or rape with homicide has been committed. End of quote. And with that resolution, the 11 men were cleared. The case came to an abrupt end with still so many questions that remain open to this very day. How could the PNP mess this case up so badly? Every time I cover a case that garners a lot of public and media attention, I sense that the PNP acts like a headless chicken running around aimlessly and also crashing and bumping into all sorts of things. The NBI, on the other hand, has a habit of over-promising. For example, when they investigated the hotel rooms, we barely learned what they have or have not found there except for the salt that was mistaken for drugs. We were, however, told that a third room on a different floor was being investigated as having some connection to what happened to Christine, but we never actually got to hear what this connection was or who that room belonged to the night Christine died. Are we to assume that none of these leads panned out because in the end the charges were dropped? We will never know. The lack of transparency is merely one of the many problems in this and many other cases. The police authorities tell us something when that something reflects well and favorable on them. Everything else, it seems, gets swept under the rug. 
But beyond the incompetence and lack of skills and training within our police forces, I was deeply saddened and disappointed with my fellow Filipinos who reacted so badly to what happened to Christine. Christine was slut-shamed and victim-blamed in ways that are beyond hurtful. On top of that, the gay men involved in this case were equally recipients of very homophobic vitriol. I understand that we like to weigh in on things. Twitter and Facebook are for free and we do not live in a country where we need to censor ourselves for fear of prosecution. However, we do need to slowly come out of archaic beliefs and ways where we feel some visceral hate towards women who drink, who are sexually active, or might appear to be sexually active, who dress in a sexy way, who wear makeup, who like to post pictures of themselves, who live their lives unencumbered by society's expectations. We need to realize that we only feel like this when women do these things. We rarely slut-shame the men for having three mistresses or side chicks at the same time. From the outside, Christine appeared to be a modern young woman. Who she really was is something that only she and her family know. Whether she made good or bad choices that night, whether she was killed or died of natural causes, nothing and no one gives us permission to victim blame her or anyone else. In the same vein, seeing suspects who happen to be gay or queer does not give you any free pass to be homophobic. You can condemn their alleged criminal or negligent actions without stooping low by calling them any of the available gay slurs out there. As for Christine's family, I hope that in some way they can find the closure they need. I am not sure how, given the circumstances surrounding this case. However, I am sure that they know that Christine is proud of them for fighting for her and her name. Christine's case brought to the fore yet again many of the flaws in our criminal justice system that need to change. If they remain the same, we will continue to see cases such as Christine's or even that case involving Brie Honson, where the very professionals who are supposed to know what they are doing are the same ones who doom the case from the very start. Lagim fam, I hope you found my coverage of Christine's case interesting. It was certainly a journey for me to go through this case again as a podcaster and not merely as a consumer of news. If you like Lagim, please make sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It does help us a lot in getting discovered by other podcast lovers. Also, if you're inclined to do so, then please follow us on social media. All links are in the show notes. For now, I am signing off for this season, and I will see you soon for season three with new cases and stories, starting on the 4th of February, 2022. Thank you for all your support these past two seasons, and as always, maraming salamat at mabuhay.